Jessica Hagman at Alden Library again, and we today we have a live video preview of a new exhibit we have going up on the fifth floor called Civil War Stories. Um, we have an event next week as well, uh, Tuesday at 2 p.m. on the fourth floor, where you can learn more about the materials in this collection and the family who plays a pretty central, or some of the people including the family who play a central role in these materials of Civil War letters. So. I'm going to move away and let you meet the um, other library staff who are working so hard on putting this together today because that's what they're doing. They're literally putting the exhibit up today on the fifth floor. So, um, Stacy, you want to come on in? Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Stacy Lavender. I'm uh, the Special Collections Librarian for our Manuscripts Collections here at Alden. Um, and yeah, so today we're installing an exhibit um, about the Civil War um, with my colleague Carmen. Um, yeah, so we'll it do you want me to show some stuff? Uh, well, yeah, what are you working on now? Okay, so yeah, so we just started putting things into the cases. This is the first case, I think, that has anything in it. Um, and so these are just some documents about what it was like being a soldier in the Civil War. We have um, just some like rules for the regiment and the list of people that didn't show up for drill. Um, uh -oh. I'll show you my favorite. Oh, yeah, so can conscience. we hear the story behind this tiny image once you... Begin? Yeah, um, okay, so this is Edwin Brown. A little tiny picture. Um, and he, the Brown family is a family that we have about 500 letters that members of that family wrote. Um, and Edwin's one of the largest featured people in that collection. We have about 200 letters, I think, from Edwin. And he fought in the Civil War. Um, and so Carmen and I have spent all this time reading these letters, um, but we have no photographs of anyone in the Brown family. So we thought until earlier this week when I opened up an envelope that has Edwin's discharge papers in it, and this teeny tiny photo of him popped out. Um, and so it was the first time that any of us got to see him, and so we were really excited about it because it was like finally getting to put a face to someone that you've known for so long. It was like having an internet friend or someone, <laughs> and then something, and then meeting them in real life. Um, so yeah, we're really excited about that, and he's going to be in the exhibit, this little tiny version, and also a slightly blown up version because it is really small. Um, but yeah, so that was a really exciting discovery for this week, and... How about we, we'll flip around and then we'll sure, talk to yeah. you. All right, so I'm going to slowly, without trying to make anyone dizzy, turn around so you can see kind of what else is going on here. So this is the fifth floor um, of the library. We're going past the exhibit space and then turning around, there's the administrative space. You can see we have some more. This whole, all of these are going to be filled, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, mm -hmm. so there's some kind of flat cases here that will eventually have parts of the display. And now there's more of the display and Carmen, who is... Um, remind me of your title again. Digital Projects Librarian. Yes, so you've been working largely on getting these materials digitized, yes. right, and online. Yes. So can you tell us a little bit about that? And then Yeah, so um, it's been a very long process. Um, the planning, digitization, um, description, um, the database design, um, and then putting those items into the database has taken us almost a year now. So we're very excited to have this material online and for people to be able to make their own Civil War stories with the materials that are available for research. So uh, as part of this exhibit, we will be focusing on the lived experience of the Civil War as well as the experience of remembering the war in subsequent decades using rare books from the Mon Center, and special, uh, the Mon Center for Archives and Special Collections. We will be focusing on material um, that will be in this case, um, which will be focusing on Paul Lawrence Dunbar, who is a famous Ohio poet whose father fought in the Civil War for the Union Army after escaping slavery after the Emancipation Proclamation. And it, this is going to be called inherited memory because not only are you seeing the inheritance that um, Paul Lawrence Dunbar got from his father, but after Dunbar died of tuberculosis when he was only in his early 30s, that mantle was passed to Elliot Blaine Henderson, another Ohioan, um, African American. He was from Columbus who wrote in the same style as Dunbar, but he was angrier. Um, he, they both wrote, um, they com composed their verse in a style that was attractive to white audiences of the day. And it, there's evidence that Henderson um, really um, rankled a bit more um, at being um, economically forced to write in this style. And so it's, it's a very interesting um, transmission of um, the, the story of African American troops from the Civil War period um, until the early 20th century. So the case behind you at the very far wall will be remembering the war. The case that Stacy is stalking at the moment is living the war. Okay. What about in the middle? Um, we're going to have a selection of um, 
um, diaries, diaries. Um, oh, from cool. several soldiers in the war contrasted with a modern artist book interpretation of a prisoner of war's diary. So it wow. has a lot of really interesting inclusions in it, such as bones, dirt, um, some, some really cool um, artistic compositions, and we'll be flipping a page in the artist book every week. And then wow. the other case um, will just be um, the patriotic letterhead and um, envelopes that were printed by a number of printers during the war period. Some of them are, are very, um, very, very, very pointed. strong. Yeah, pointed. Um, have very strong messages about death to traitors and and the tree of liberty and um, so like propaganda. In yes, and of themselves. exactly propaganda. Yes. Um, the the people who study these call them patriotic covers, but they're, it's very much propaganda. Wow. It, it's also very um, very colorful, um, very visually appealing. It worked well for the exhibit. Okay, and we'll be swapping those out. Yes. On, okay. You can, yes. You can probably get both of you in if you want to. Uh. Yeah, we'll be swapping the patriotic stationery out. I think weekly we have a lot of it, so we want it to get um, as much of it to get shown as possible, and it's sensitive, so we want it yes, not there, to be out. Yes, there's definitely there's concerns about the light sensitive nature of oh, the materials really? um, that are going to be in the exhibit because ink fades when exposed to light, um, and the paper will yellow. But um, for example, um, the blood on William McKnight on the letter yeah, we have a, William we have McKnight's body um, might not be on display um, all three months. We have a facsimile <laughs> that we will be um, putting up if the uh, if it looks like if it, it starts to look like yeah. it's having a problem. Okay. We'll swap it out. Is that um, was it like a cheaper paper because of it was like mass produced or um, what like well, or is it just the nature uh, of the time so period? I'm, it has to do with the transition from rag pulp paper to wood pulp paper in the 1850s. So um, earlier paper um, tends to last a lot longer. The, um, the very um, toxic process of creating paper in the early manufacturing period um, involves a lot of acids. So that is um, just, it's the inherent vice, um, as it's called in conservation circles, of the material. It's just from the moment it is manufactured, um, that acid is just eating away at the fibers, and they're getting shorter and shorter and shorter, which is what makes it brittle, and also makes it discolored. There's a, a yeah. particular um, chemical in the, and I think maybe the lignin of the um, of, of the wood pulp that causes it to discolor. I think it's a binder. I'm not sure. <laughs> I mean, you haven't studied the chemistry of paper down <laughs> to the that level of detail. Um, okay, so could you just talk a little bit for like those of us who aren't who don't do exhibits like this? What is like the process like for deciding what goes in, and then? It looks like you're doing like these things in the background. Like, could you just walk us a little bit through that process of creating? So, yeah. yeah. Um, in exhibit design, you want to create multiple levels of possible engagement. So you want to be able to visually arrest the people who are, this is a high traffic, low engagement area. So you want to be able to have things that will really um, pop out. And maybe somebody will just learn one fact, and that's fine. Then you also want to be able to um, engage like the, the medium, um, visitors, so people who will maybe spend five minutes here, they might read, um, each one of these wall case sections will have a theme, and so they might read a little bit of the introduction to that theme. Um, and then we also have individual item labels, because we, um, as a academic library, have to follow best practices um, in terms of citations and um, allowing people to, because these material will all be available for in-person research. That's one of the great things about a right. library as opposed to a museum, which museums are also awesome, but um, we want people to be able to follow these threads on their own if they so desire. So each item will be identified, there will be more information about um, some of the items. It's just, it's, it's a multi-level um, engagement process. Okay. Yeah, and for me, I mean, I, we sort of split the cases up and we're working um, pretty freely on our each on our own sections, but for me it starts out as a much more theoretical process, like the kinds of things that I want to be in the exhibit and engage in being able to engage different people and then the next thing you do is try to actually lay it out in the cases and see sort of logistically what yeah. will work and that <laughs> help that makes you have to make a lot of changes as well. Mm -hmm. um, so a few weeks ago I, we both laid stuff out in our cases to make sure like we had enough stuff and that what we wanted would fit and that sort of thing. Um, and then today we've been putting up these um, colorful backings in the cases because usually they're just white and they're kind of dingy looking. Um, and then, yeah, starting to put the physical stuff in, and then next will come labels and um, text and that sort of thing. So it's there's still a lot of steps left to go. It sounds and, pretty intensive. Yeah, yeah. and if we're we're trying to um, to create um, avenues for people to be able to explore these individual items online. We'll see how that works. Out. Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. Hopefully there will be like a link you can follow to yeah. the item online or something like that. But that's not no promises yeah. there. 
Okay. And so some of these materials are part of the Civil War correspondence collection? Mm -hmm. Yes. So and can you just kind of briefly tell us about what that is exactly? Yeah, so it's or election. what's online, I guess. Yeah, okay, so right now what's online is the Brown family letters, which I mentioned earlier is one of our largest collections, of almost 500 letters. Um, so those are already publicly available online through our digital collection site. Um, and then slowly we'll be adding more Civil War letters from other collections. We have about 15 collections that have Civil War letters. So theoretically, almost everything that's in this exhibit, at least the Civil War era documents, not the rare books, um, will eventually be part of this collection. It's just going to be a slowly growing mm -hmm. kind of thing. Because that's also a pretty intensive process, right, Carmen? Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, and as soon as I'm done with this exhibit, I can actually start adding stuff in again. Um, I had I had to take a break, um, and yeah, yeah. Um, the best uh, three weeks of the we'll exhibit yeah, for us. We'll be back to okay. regularly scheduled programming next week. Hopefully. Yeah. Okay. So when you come to visit this exhibit, be you know, that Stacy and Carmen and um, the students who probably help you like with put the materials online, like and all that kind of stuff, have been working on this for literally more than a year. And the exhibit <laughs> itself, it sounds like, for a couple of weeks intensively, and then not to mention all the planning. So, um, can you just briefly talk about the event on Tuesday and what will happen there? Yeah, sure. There's a lot of stuff going on at the event. Um, the dean will introduce us. We'll talk for a little bit about the process of getting the digital archive online and also what's in it, what you can expect to find, how you can search in it, um, what potential uses um, this could have for research, um, why these people who were not famous leaders or generals um, are important, and why um, being able to study the experience of ordinary Ohioans can um, lead us to some very startling conclusions about what life was like here. And then we will go into um, the dramatic portion of the event where Students and faculty from the theater department will be dramatizing the letters. They will be wearing um, clothing that suggests the period. They're not going full out in costume, but they're currently practicing um, their letters. They will be embodying five different characters yep. from the Brown family. Um, and you'll get a really good sense of um, their trials and tribulations um, when um, the world literally split apart for them. Um, and they're, you know, Southeast Ohio is right on the border. Um, there's a lot of interesting things that were happening here during that time period. Um, and then finally, there will be a hands-on per, um, participatory session for all people who are um, going to be in the um, uh, attending the event where they will get to make their own Civil War era um, letter using um, period stationery, um, fountain pens, ink, and sealing wax. Awesome. That sounds like... Fun. Yeah, and there's food, really fun. Um, yeah, food. 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 Not near the materials, I'm yes. sure. No, but no, yes. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Um, all right. Anything? Do you want to show us anything you have handy, like just close up, or is it all kind of packed away still? Um, we have Grandpa's diary. Yeah, we have Edwin's diary. Oh, um, Edwin. Um, this is just a tiny strip of fabric um, that Edwin wrote his name and home on and he would have um, sewed this into all of his uniforms oh wow um so it's actually four different um same thing yeah, yeah four repetitions um for four different pieces of clothing um and then we have this diary uh, which is one of two that edwin wrote during the war in pencil um he was less literate perhaps than some of the other yeah. people uh, represented in the collection so let me tell you transcribing it was interesting um he uses a lot of really phonetic spelling. Um, it makes a lot more sense if you're reading it out loud with a little bit of an accent. You can see the accent in the in the letters that he chose um, when spelling the words. Um, it's, it was it was a very interesting story, especially when he was um, serving at a hospital and he's talking. The Civil War was the first um, <laughs> war where um, morphine. Um, especially and um, and advances in surgery allowed for mass amputations. So when people were getting limbs shattered by um, by the the newfangled bullets, um, then they would just take off the limb. And so he's talking about like three limbs off today, four limbs off the next day. Um, it's just it's a it's a very personal, visceral um, window into this experience. Yeah, he talks. I know there's like one quote where he's like, "I've gotten so good at." cutting off fingers is as easy as pie or something. Yeah. Not exactly that, but to that effect, and you're like, whoa. Wow. And he lost a finger as well. Yeah, um, yeah. And he was given, like, a two-week furlough because of it, and then they sent yeah. him right back. So, wow. That, wow. Yeah. 
Okay. Well, I'm really looking forward to learning more about Edwin <laughs> and all the Browns. And, um, yeah, is there anything else you wanted to say before no, we no, sign no, on? No, I think that's you, you just really got to come and um, see the whole experience. Yeah, yes. <laughs> yeah, I think so. We're going to have to get some pictures for sure when um, everything is back up. And I love that you're um, trading. I'm going to show these, like, flat cases here. Yeah. What you, so the one is the one over there is going to have the letters with the different ones mm -hmm. each week. Yeah. Okay. So we'll try to get some pictures and put them on our Instagram for you so you can see. Um, but please join us on Tuesday at 2 p.m. on the fourth floor of the library. And thank you so much to Carmen and Stacy, who I'm going to swivel over here and show, for all of their work and for being willing to be on camera and talk about it endlessly. <laughs> all right. So thank you both. Thank you. Thanks.